Uh, I study women in politics. This previous fall I taught a course on women in politics, which was really amazing to be able to teach during the presidential election. And I study um, American political behavior and identities, so I focus um, a lot on public opinion and political communication and how people respond to the messages they hear from uh, candidates and political elites and how that affects their behavior. I think my perspective too, having studied women in politics and looking at the history of the women's movements over time and just seeing what, it's been a struggle over time for women to gain the rights that they have now. I was researching and I had no idea that it wasn't until 1976 that the first marital rape law was passed or that in the 1960s, I believe, women still weren't able to have a credit card in their own name. Um, these sort of uh, achievements for women that really have only occurred recently. And I, when I look at the discourse that was occurring during this election, it worried me about where we might be falling back to. I wanted to get involved. This had the chance to be something very historic, depending on how many people showed up and how widespread the marches were, and I wanted to be able to witness that from both an academic stance um, as a personal activist stance, and also we were going um, with our friend Kelly King to support her involvement in it. Are you filming? Kelly is a PhD student at University of North Carolina Greensboro studying counseling education, and I know that was important to her. It was pretty great, too, to go up as a group of three graduate women who are very much, I think, invested in a more open America in the future. So on our first night up in um, Alexandria, Kelly, Bailey, and Kelly's mom went out to dinner. And as was widespread through the movement growing was this knitting of pink pussy hats for people to wear at the march. And we were sitting at the bar in the restaurant and saw two women enter who were wearing these two. Yeah, and so I went, I, I gathered up my nerve and put on my researcher hat and walked over to these two women and introduced myself and just said, I'd really like to hear about why you came to the march. My name is Patty Palandrea. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. All right. Uh, this is a very good friend of mine. And once uh, Trump was given the nomination, and one, we were beside ourselves mm -hmm. on what we can do next. My issue is definitely women's rights. Uh, with Planned Parenthood, I'm very concerned what could happen with Planned Parenthood. We need it. Uh, also, the LGBT community is very close and dear to my heart. Uh, so those are two issues, yeah. definitely. I'm Roxy Padrid. I am. I came here from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, Patty's a good friend, so when we heard about the nomination, we talked and said, let's go. We heard there was going to be a march. And I'm marching not just for women's rights, but for all the rights of the disenfranchised in our society um, that I am afraid are going to be overlooked in this new administration. I think the takeaway for me from what I heard from these women was that they had fought for women's rights already in their life, um, their lives, and they wanted to make sure that all of the achievements that women had gained over the past decades wasn't being eroded by the election of uh, this president who has made some concerning statements. Uh, and I think I was also excited to hear that they that although they were motivated by women's rights and concerns for women's rights, they're very much also motivated just by a concern about other marginalized groups like the LGBT community or the Black Lives Matter movement. And that's, you know, something that become, became apparent when we later reached the march the following day that this was, while this was a women's march, there were many sub-issues included within it and they were all linked with the goal of promoting equality for all sorts of groups that right now many of us believe are have a, a less equal voice in the public discussion. Yeah, I think Roxy touches on this when she, as Bailey mentioned, says that she's not just fighting for women's rights but for the rights of oppressed people. Um, and Bailey's right, at the march you could see all these different s sub-movements 
that people were very passionate about, whether it be LGBTQ rights, the environment, Black Lives Matter, immigration rights, um, you know, religious freedom, whatever it may be, that these things were all intertwined with women's rights. And the fact that women experience all of these things differently than um, men do in our society makes it so that these are all important events. Um, and at the march, uh, Kamala Harris, the senator from California, spoke about this, saying that when she was running for office, people would often come up to her and say, can you talk to us about women's rights? And she would say, in response to that, well, I'm so glad you want to hear about the economy, or I'm so glad you want to hear about national defense, because all of these things matter to women in ways that don't, aren't really reflected in the way that um, they're talked about in politics and society currently. Um, and we got there pretty early, so it was hard for us to tell amongst, amidst the crowd how many people were there. You know, we couldn't get an aerial view to see just how far back the crowd went um, down Independence Ave. Um, but seeing footage later and reading about um, the estimated numbers later, I mean, I think it's at about 575,000 now that showed up in D.C. alone, um, which isn't the largest march that's been in D.C. I mean, the Vietnam War protests in 69 had about 600,000. The Million Man March in 95 had about 900,000, but it's still one of the largest. And then across the whole United States, easily three and a half million mar people marching for this. Um, one of the largest protests and demonstrations, I think, in the United States. Um, so it's definitely more than the organizers expected. I think we, um, the turnout was double what they expected to be in D.C. Um, and so figuring out how to corral that large of a group of people was something they had to deal with. We will not allow our compassionate souls to get stepped on. We want the best for all Americans. No hate, no bigotry, no Muslim registry. We value education, health care, and equality. Yeah, and I guess we did get a sense of how big it was. The, the small clues was one, we couldn't move. We got to our spot and we stayed there for five hours because there, I mean, there was nowhere to go. And you knew that if you left your spot also, you'd never get it back, right? So people were trying to shift through at times because they need to use the restroom or find a missing group member and they'd squeeze on by. But early on, we were just like, we're just gonna stay here. We're not going anywhere. And I think once they actually started, once the group actually started marching, um, it became clear that it was too big of a crowd to really put down one certain march path. So initially we were supposed to march down Constitution, I believe, it ended up marching down Pennsylvania um, to the White House and you know the police blocked off streets. There was no way that they could keep that many people contained to a smaller area. I mean, and people were just spilling out everywhere. I mean, all of Pennsylvania Ave was completely packed along the sides of the street were bleachers from the inaugural parade where people were f filled in and cheering. Along all the buildings on Pennsylvania Ave, people are out on the balconies, up on the roofs, cheering down. And then all the side streets that are crossing Pennsylvania are just also completely packed with people. Everywhere you looked was just completely packed with people. It was pretty incredible. I'm Amelia and I'm marching because women's rights are human rights. So I think overall, you know, it was definitely a success in the terms of the number of people that showed up. The organizers did really um, made a concerted effort to make sure that the speakers that they had at the march were um, representing all different kinds of ethnic groups and racial groups and sexual identifications, religious identifications, um, in an attempt to be inclusive. Um, I think something that I felt like was really highlighted by the experience was that we still have a long way to go, um, not only in making sure that the message from the march is heard by you know the current administration and people that are in office, but also a long way to go within ourselves and um, this conversation that needs to happen within the women's rights movement with women of different, you know, women of color experiencing things different than white women and women of different sexual identifications experiencing, thing different, experiencing things differently than straight women. Um, 
and being able to recognize your privilege within the group of women. You know, this isn't overall an oppressed group, but there are still ways in which me as a white woman, I experience things much more differently than um, the rest of the women that were at the march. And I saw moments of that um, not exactly happening at the march where people were kind of um, talking over some of the women of color who were speaking. Um, and so there's definitely still a long way to go. Yeah, and that, that tension that did occur a little bit, you know, that, that you're speaking of, I don't think it was necessarily avoidable because this is such a large movement or the the march itself brought in so many different people and so many different activists who all very care who all cared very much about um, these different issues and m multiple issues and I knew going in that I wasn't going to agree with everyone that was attending and I didn't necessarily agree with every speaker on stage but being there and listening to it and hearing these viewpoints was very important to me and I think very educational and I walked away thinking, oh, I need to educate myself more with respect to these issues. I need to learn more about the Black Lives Matters movement and understand as much as I am capable uh, to what is motivating them and the, and the struggles they face and understand more about the environment and the LGTB community. And so while there was that tension and it definitely showed that we have a lot of work to go or to, to do, um, I hope that people came away from the march with some of that understanding of, oh, I need to be educated in these areas. I should go out and learn more about these groups. They were here, they joined with me in this important march, and I want to um, see if I can speak to their concerns as well as what brought me individually here. And that, you know, that's a hopeful uh, attitude to take, um, you know, bringing in this large of a movement and this many different people can be difficult and we already saw that we definitely saw that on the Facebook groups of the marches as they were coming up people disagreeing about exactly what the march means or who should be allowed issues about whether or not pro-life groups could be included as official groups associated with it and all of these were important questions and we got um, some emotional responses and um, anger in discussing them which I think in some, it's good because people care and we need to care about these issues and we need to push each other to think past our own experiences. I think that as researchers we should take more advantage of these sort of events as they occur and obviously this was somewhat unprecedented but in terms of getting out on the street and asking people what they're thinking and feeling um, it was also interesting for me because I was torn a bit and wanting to just participate and experience it as one of uh, the regular participants without my researcher hat on. And it was, that was a, a tension for me. And I think for political scientists in the future, where we tend to study, I mean, we study political behavior, we study political institutions, political norms, and of course, we develop strong opinions about our political institutions, and we're kind of watching uh, individuals really shake up these norms and act outside of the box. And I think as political scientists, we need to recognize we have an investment in this that goes beyond research, even if we try to pretend that we don't. It seems hard to me to be a political scientist and not care about the institutions and have certain beliefs about what they mean. And at least from some of my conversations with other academics in the field, uh, professors and students alike, th this tension between wanting to just study politics and wanting to participate and be an activist might be heightened for our field in the upcoming years.